This is Dr. Kate Eckert with the Form, Function, and Flow Lab podcast. I'm a chiropractor, yoga instructor, anatomy junkie, and movement educator. And I am looking forward to exposing you to all sorts of ways that you can prehab your body to avoid injury and maintain those hobbies, activities, sports that you love to do. And we'll also be focusing a lot on the pregnant and postpartum journey and making sure that you can return to those activities that you love or even keep doing them while you're pregnant. Well, why don't you just tell us a little bit about, you know, being a doula, getting, um, how, what led you there, that kind of thing. Yeah, sure. Um, so I am the owner of Golden Lotus Doula Services. I do birth doula services, postpartum doula services. Um, I also do bereavement, um, birth photography, placenta encapsulation, and childbirth education. So I have my hands on a lot of different things in the birth industry. Um, and I initially got interested in it because um, I grew up actually hearing my birth story all the time because I was a twin Mm -hmm. and my Mm -hmm. mom gave birth to us naturally actually in Pittsburgh at West Penn Hospital Um, at the time there were midwives there so I grew up kind of hearing about it and being interested in it and then for my nonprofit business degree I had to choose Um, all my electives in like a minor so I chose women and gender studies and learned more and more about um, the way childbirth is structured in America and how it is extremely medically managed and then I had a friend go through a traumatic childbirth that was pretty similar to my mom's experience almost like 20 years prior to that at the time so Hmm. um, it led me to become interested in taking a doula training and my friend was also taking a doula training and she invited me along so I like looked up what it was and I ended up taking one my senior year of college um and I took a local doula out to coffee and kind of picked her brain a little bit about what it was like to be a doula um and then I started attending births and I've been a doula ever since so I'm going on my sixth year um, as a doula, and I've been doing it full time for three years. And the first few years, I did it just part time here and there. Um, and now I have a uh, like private practice of we're adding our sixth doula in August. So uh, oh my exciting. gosh, wow! We serve all over Pittsburgh within about an hour of Pittsburgh. Nice. I did not know that. Lily was my doula two years ago with my son Deacon and it was an awesome experience. So that's awesome to see you have grown so much in two years. That's amazing. Yeah, I can't even believe it's been two years. I feel like I tell your birth story all the time to people (laughs) without using your name, but I like recall just so many parts of it. Um, Mm -hmm. Just kind of talking about how, you know, Deacon's birth went. So mm-hmm. it's really cool to kind of also watch all of the different babies grow. I stay connected with my family via social media, as most of us do these days. But mm-hmm. um, just watching everybody's babies grow up is so cool. So yeah, for yeah, sure. For sure. That is really interesting about the um, how your mom's birth story paralleled your friends that many years later. For sure. Yeah. And I mean, so my, a little bit about my mom's is that, um, you know, the doctor had to actually do like an internal rotation of my twin sister. Mm -hmm. So, and you know, with my friend, the doctor like reached inside and did, uh, internal maneuver as well. It wasn't like a breach to cephalic rotation, but, Mm -hmm. um, it was like a posterior, presentation and mm-hmm. they attempted to flip the baby but I mean she was birthing naturally but a lot of times I believe that you know sometimes these doctors get used to touching people with epidurals mm-hmm. and then they don't have as gentle of a touch with people that are not having epidurals um, or maybe they like forget or just it's not a well-practiced thing to touch people in labor that are not 
you know, completely numb from the waist down. So mm-hmm. then it ends up being this really sometimes traumatic event, unfortunately, um, mm. with, you know, a lot of providers not knowing how to treat a labor that isn't medicated. Yeah. I mean, I can't even, I cannot wrap my head around having someone put their hands inside me during the active laboring process. Yeah, it's just kind of wild. So, I mean, since I have seen so many different births, um, I mean, I actually decided that I want to pursue midwifery school because it's so much easier to just be Mm -hmm. the provider I want for my clients than for me to constantly feel like I'm fighting this battle for them or hoping that, you know, we're going to be able to advocate for them to have the birth they want. I would much rather just give them the birth they want. Yeah. Be the provider for them in the first place that gives them the best chance of having that experience. right? Right. Right. Now, as a doula, do you find that you have that you are able to advocate for your you know i feel like the mom is in the moment typically and the dad sometimes can get steamrolled a bit right by the whole hospital environment and my guess would i've never had this had to have this experience because i delivered deacon at the as you know the midwife center um or the birthing center in pittsburgh but I could imagine that you you are their advocate in the hospital to help them get the birth they want and the birth plan that they were hoping for. Yeah, I would say that, you know, I love it whenever people can advocate for themselves, but I also understand that some of these moments are not like you just physically are too encompassed in what you're doing to be able to speak up for yourself, right? And so we yeah. serve that role as kind of the bridge between the client and the providers or the client and the nurses to relay their desires, but also, you know, stick up for them if they feel like they're kind of being, yeah, like steamrolled with what the provider wants their birth to look like. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I feel like every birth that a partner goes to, they tend to get more comfortable. Like definitely first time dads are much more nervous about the experience, I would say, than second or third time dads. Sure. And then it also depends on the partner's um, personality too. Some partners are very comfortable advocating and other partners are like kind of fly on the wall type personalities. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I always say your partner, you're used to your partner supporting every obstacle you've ever had to face in your marriage or relationship together. Mm -hmm. So it's only natural that you would find it comforting to have them with you in labor. And they know that they want to help, but sometimes they don't know how, um, Mm -hmm. because it's a new experience for them. So your birth really should bring you and your partner closer together actually. And your doula is a part of facilitating that connection with your partner during labor. It shouldn't be, you know, something that they get in the way of. It's almost like your duel is your left hand, your partner is your right. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we all kind of try to work together as a team. And I like to kind of unite the team under a common goal. So I never try to like run in there and assume that the doctors are going to be, you know, sure. This person that's going to try to come in with their own agenda. Like I always assume the best and come in with good intentions and Mm -hmm. assume the best of people um, to try to get everyone on the same page. Nice. Yeah. My, when I, so initially I have an older daughter, Genevieve, and um, with her birth, I was supposed to be at a birth center in Youngstown that closed two weeks before she was due. And um, they had doulas there. So I was supposed to have a doula for her birth that was on staff at the birth center. But then I ended up having her in the hospital, so I did not have a doula for her. And it's not something I brought up to my husband because I knew that there would be one where we were supposed to give birth. So with Deacon, I was like, I want, I want to have a doula. And he's like, what, why? What is? What do they do? What am I? I thought that was my job. And I was like, oh, I think they do lots of other, you know, just as a support 
And I'm the type of person, I don't know if you remember, but I like more like silence. (laughs) I would rather suffer in uh, silence and just focus than have like a lot of cheerleaders. So it's not like you were supporting me by cheering me on, but just being there. And I think you held my feet for a long, long, long time on while I was on all fours. That was pretty uh, crucial. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. his birth. I think also just giving you know guidance on hey you know I've seen different lots of different scenarios so if for some reason we have any kind of hang up or stall or failure to progress quote unquote you know mm-hmm. or um, asynclitic babies like all those little things that come up in labor where you have a professional that you can turn to and be like oh yeah, you know, I've seen this fire hydrant position work really well for a baby in this exact position. Or, Mm -hmm. hey, why don't we try like a lunge because that opens your pelvis side to side and that can make more room for them to come down and rotate. Like all these little adjustments that we don't know because of hindsight, right? But Mm -hmm. that can make your labor hopefully a faster and more comfortable experience for you. Yeah. Yeah. also things like counter pressure or like hip squeezes or, you know, like these different Mm -hmm. types of massage that are labor specific where I have done it for like, you know, hours and hours at, uh, I'm up to 128 births now at this point. So, you know, I like to think that I'm really good at reading a room and knowing what somebody needs before they even need it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's definitely, um, a skill set that is really hard to accomplish just in, you know, uh, dad's reading of like the birth partner, for example, I think it's a great thing to prepare partners for labor, but I always tell them like, just you being there is the biggest thing that is going to bring your partner comfort. You mm-hmm. know, you don't need to feel like you have to have yeah. all this training to do this you know we're going to give you guidance on how to support your partner when they're laboring so mm-hmm. for yeah. sure and so I've never delivered with a doctor but from what I gather they're not in the room nearly as much as the nurse midwife and when I delivered in the hospital my nurse midwife was there I mean most of the time essentially. So she was able to give me, um, lots of, uh, that kind of advice in the hospital, but I'm guessing that for those births that you do that are, you know, delivered by doctors, they probably aren't in the room a ton until it's go time more so. Yeah. So I would say, um, can expect your doctor to come in every four hours saying you know we're going to check your cervix and then you can expect them to come in you know when you're crowning basically (laughs) uh and to catch the baby I mean I've actually seen nurses attempt to hold the baby's head in until the doctor can get their gloves on oh my god in the room which can damage your pelvic floor right so like in that in that case you know obviously there's a lot of advocacy that goes on as far as like, no, she's pushing. We need to, you need to let her do what she needs to do. Yeah. But also, um, you know, I think a lot of these nurses get really reamed out if a delivery happens without the doctor being in the room and it happens really quickly, for example, or, you know, cause it's all hospitals, billing systems and all these other things that go into like the logistics of a hospital system. Like, you know, mm-hmm. they want to charge for catching your baby. And if they're not physically catching it, uh, well, then you can fight the bill, right? So, yeah. Um, yeah, they're, or like, for example, lithotomy, like people being almost, you know, forced to birth on their back because that's the way the doctor wants them to be. Um, I always say, you know, even on more on one side or the other, just tilted slightly gives your tailbone more room to flex. Mm -hmm. I understand you're tired. You've been working really hard through your labor. You might want to lay down and that feels good at that point, but even just laying on your side and like wrapping that top leg up around that knee 
Mm-hmm. And pushing on your side can feel so much better and give your baby so much more room to move. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would say, you know, it's about all the little adjustments that can make your experience so much better in right. like the long run. So I was curious about that too, because I actually had, I, I treat a ton, a ton of pregnant moms um, in the office and I have a mom due here in the fall and she was asking me about what the rules were at our local hospital about delivering in other positions than on your back. And I really didn't have a good answer for her because I have never had that experience. Mm-hmm. Are they allowed with doctors to deliver in a variety of positions or how? So it depends on the doctor. Like I know, I mean, a lot of them, I know their personalities now because I've had a lot of deliveries with the doctors in the area. So I know, for example, like there's one doctor at West Penn where unless you are in the position you want to deliver your baby in, when he walks in the room and say, when he says, okay, go ahead, flip on your back here, you have to be like firm. Like, no, I'm actually comfortable right here. Or, you know, I think she's more comfortable right here. Mm -hmm. So I think just being firm and having your advocates that are in the room be firm with whatever position you want to be in, being in that position before they come in the room is a great idea. Telling your doctor you want to try different positions or different styles of pushing Mm -hmm. um, rather than, you know, that traditional, like, closed mouth, holding breath, pushing, Mm -hmm. Um, which, you know, works well for some people some people feel like that they can direct their energy well with that type of pushing but I always like try to say let's try a few different ways and then if you like that way that's fine and then whenever baby's crowning usually we ask them to do like horse lifts slow it down kind Mm -hmm. of low like birthday candles out so that you can kind of really let the baby relax and soften those tissues and like stretch so that those tissues can like unfold around your baby's head like they're meant to really Mm -hmm. slowly. Um, So that usually helps to prevent a lot of the tearing and separation for our um, people that are delivering with doctors in the hospital, especially because, you know, they're not well-versed on necessarily like the physiological childbirth. They usually see medicated childbirth Mm -hmm. um, and augmented childbirth. So when you come in with somebody that's laboring naturally and you want like warm compresses on your perineum and you know, maybe Mm -hmm. like oil rather than like the medical lubricant that they use or like all these other things, Mm -hmm. I think they kind of like take a step back, but then they also realize like, Hey, this person has, you know, an advocate for them, like a doula Mm -hmm. and they have gotten this far in labor doing what they're doing. And they're serious about it. You can tell because you know, they came, with a plan, they educated and prepared themselves, right? They equipped themselves with pelvic floor therapy, with chiropractic, and prepare their whole body for this experience. Mm-hmm. Um, so I feel like, you know, your brain doesn't understand try. Your brain understands, like, I am going to have a natural childbirth. Or, like, you know, mm-hmm. I try to tell people, tell yourself what kind of experience you want to have because – there's no, you know, ifs. And if you're motivated to do it, you will do it because it's like 95% mental. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, you can attest to that. I'm sure you, each time it's just, you know, this yeah. mental, mental uh, strength and like overcoming that barrier. You mm-hmm. know? Yeah. I was, I was really nervous with my first that, it was, I've never really had bad pain in my life ever. And everyone says how terrible the pain is. And I was worried that since at the last minute I had to have her at the hospital, that an epidural would be accessible and I would want to do it because of the pain would be too bad. And then when it came into it, you, I got into such a zone it literally never even crossed my mind I was just like I can do this this isn't that bad you know you just um yeah and I have some people who are like you know the thought of an epidural didn't even cross my mind Mm -hmm. because I was just so 
like I was in labor land. Like I was mm-hmm. in like a trance. I had to, with every contraction, go to a different place mm-hmm. and imagine myself not even in the room. Yeah. And, you know, that's almost like the goal is to find that place where you can mentally go to and then physically relaxing and breathing through every single, you know, wave that's coming at you mm-hmm. to really cope with that. And if you can do that and then you get breaks in between, I think we're capable of much more than we give ourselves credit for. Yeah. And one thing that I've heard with epidurals is that, you know, you're not as in connection with your, your pushing because you don't feel it as much. And I think that for me, that would have been a thousand percent true because with my daughter, they kept asking me over and over again if I felt ready to push and, you know, all the reading and research I'd done and continuing ed for pelvic floor health and everything has been, you know, don't push until you feel like there's no other option. Like you have to, you can't stop yourself from pushing. And I kept saying like, no, I'm not, I'm not there yet. I'm, you know, it's, it's not time, but if that had been like no feeling down there or not connected and they told me it was time to push, I probably, I would have, and I don't think that I would have been ready, but. Yeah. And then that leads to these three, four hour pushing phases. And then, you know, babies deselling, not handling pushing well, well, maybe they're not ready to be, you know, pushed right now because Mm -hmm. they still have a lot of molding with their head to do, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, I had a birth on the side of the Liberty Bridge two years ago too and that was like her labor was not even that close together and like not even that strong but we were like okay probably time to like head in see where we're at right Mm -hmm. thinking that maybe we'll get sent home well her water broke going down Grandview Avenue from Mount Washington and she said I was following in the car right behind them She said that by the time they were at the light at the bottom of the Grandview Avenue, turning onto the Liberty Bridge, she knew that the baby was coming and she told her husband to call 911. And then I kind of see them like swerving a little bit back and forth. And I'm like, oh gosh, maybe her water broke. You know, I'm Uh not like thinking like, oh, a baby's about to come. And then I see them pull over and I obviously pull over and throw on my flashers. And then I run up to the window, her passenger side door, and I see her unraveling a triple nuchal cord from the babies, like around the baby. Oh and my god! And she gosh. just didn't even have time to get her pants down. She just opened up her uh, gray sweatpants and picked up her baby out of them like it was nothing. Oh my god! <laughs> and she just like pulled up the baby, unraveled her, and then you know I like opened the door and started like rubbing the baby's back with her shirt. Mm-hmm. Um, and the baby started crying. And then, of course, like, the 911 operator is completely useless. He's like, tie off the cord with a shoelace. I'm like, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. <laughs> like, we're leaving the cord to that. So that's the safest thing right now, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I, thank God, am trained in NRP. Um, as a midwife assistant, when I helped out with home birth, I was actually, you know, able to be responsible for a baby at the time of birth if they had to deal with something with the person that was giving birth. Oh, so, nice. um, you know, I'm like immediately doing like a newborn exam on this child, basically like totally mm-hmm. not my doula hat, but I was like, this is definitely a special case scenario. So, mm-hmm. you know, trying to make sure her baby's coming around well, and then she starts crying. We're all like, what a relief. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we went to McGee actually to deliver the placenta. We just threw on our flashers and headed up the road, but I'll never forget this one Pittsburgh bus driver's face. He like pulled up next to us and like wanted us, wanted to bitch us out or like flip us off for stopping up traffic. And Mm -hmm. then like, she just held up the baby still attached to the cord, screaming and crying. (laughs) And he's like, Oh my God, do you need me to call someone? (laughs) And her husband's like, we're on the phone with 911. It's okay. (laughs) Oh my gosh. That is amazing. Yeah. And it just shows you like the power of the human body. Sometimes, you know, you don't think that that baby's coming soon, but it could be 15 minutes away from being born and you don't even think that the contractions are that strong. And then, bam, mm-hmm. you know, the bag of water was the only thing holding holding her back. So That's pretty yeah. awesome. Yeah. It can be pretty, pretty exciting sometimes. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, for sure. 
I think one valuable thing I did in prepping for um, birth was reading this book of birth stories by Ina May Gaskin. Yeah. And it was just so all over the place in, um, you know, different presentations, different lengths of birth, different, um, you know, if it's your first versus your fifth. And it was just really helpful so that whatever I came across in my birth, I wasn't like, oh, no, (laughs) oh, no, this is not good because um, it can be so different. Both my kids were actually pretty different. And both of them, I couldn't imagine um, uh, giving birth on my back. That would have been pretty terrible for me personally I know that's not for everybody but for myself yeah I think it's um you know really about listening to your body and you can start that so early on in your pregnancy and in your life even like you know when you're trying to conceive even trying to connect with your body and your reproductive system in a way that you haven't before um that we're just not really taught to do as people in America you know Mm -hmm. um I can't tell you how many people I like go to shop birth education class to that are like shocked, you know, they're like adults and know nothing about their anatomy Mm -hmm. or that a cervix dilates, you know, and like they've heard of cervix, but they didn't know, they don't know what 10 centimeters looks like. And they don't, Mm -hmm. they didn't realize that it's not your vagina that dilates, you know, (laughs) it's it's wild. Like people are like, do they just look under the covers and they just Mm -hmm. tell you how dilated you are? I'm like, no, they have to do an internal exam. You know, like yeah. grown adults that don't know this. Yeah. And it, like to me, it's shocking as a birth worker, but then I'm like, you know, it's just our American education system isn't that focused on teaching people about their bodies. We get what, maybe a couple classes on it in uh, high school and that's about it. Yeah. But, sure. Yeah. I think we kind of have to seek out the information for ourselves. And unfortunately, a lot of times that only happens when people are actually pregnant. Right. And I, we, so I've done birth fit training and prenatal and postnatal continuing ed through a rehab aspect, a chiropractic aspect. So I didn't really feel like I needed the birth class, but I didn't want to teach my husband the birth class. So I went to a a Bradley session in Youngstown with him and it was so cute. He was like writing notes furiously. He's like, "Did you know that?" And I was like, "Yeah, I knew that. I knew that." But it that one that um, curriculum, I guess you would say, was pretty in depth. I was impressed with the amount of info that they gave. But it was like twelve hours long. I think a lot of birth classes are maybe not as involved as that in hospital settings. Right. Yeah, I've heard great things about the Bradley method. Um, I am traditionally trained as a hypnobirthing teacher, but I have since kind of separated myself from the Hypnobirthing Institute as far as like their exact methodology Mm -hmm. because their class is very specific in the way that it needs to be taught. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to also have um, a conversation with my clients about what it looks like when you have to change your plan and Mm -hmm. hypnobirthing really didn't want you to focus on anything that wasn't, you know, absolutely what you needed to fill your mind with, like manifesting this beautiful labor experience. Uh, But I felt like it was really important to my clients that we address what transfer looked like. Right. So I had to kind of adjust my curriculum to say, okay, this is now a custom kind of class. It's Mm -hmm. not exactly hypnobirthing because we are, going to talk about what that looks like because honestly it's an injustice not to I don't Mm -hmm. want you to be caught off guard whenever like if that has to happen and you're like I didn't even think about transferring you know or what would that even look like or what would my choices even be in that setting yeah Um, so I find it gives people comfort to know more rather than less oh for sure I even I for my pregnant patients in the office I always say you know I respect any decision that you make and how you're going to, you know, formulate your birth plan. But here's my suggestion is that you need to research every single option of what might happen to you because you don't want to think you're going to have a 
pain-free cakewalk epidural style delivery and then it not work not get there early enough only work on half your body and then you're panicked when right. it doesn't I mean nobody wants that to be their experience and same with c-section like most people most people don't want a c-section but you should really know how that's going to look if that has to happen I think but for sure yeah, I think there's so many tools that you learn in those like natural birth classes like Bradley, like you know, birthing like hypno babies that you can apply to a medicated birth even if you choose to go that route or mm-hmm. even a C section. Yeah. So I'm like those relaxation and breathing techniques are life skills. They're not just something that you use for a birth. Mm-hmm. Um, and also like knowing that you can make any experience a calm and empowered experience Mm -hmm. where you feel connected to your body your partner your baby and your birth like that can be a thread or a theme throughout any birth that you experience Mm -hmm. not just now for births and definitely not just um you know pain-free births especially with the epidurals like a lot of people think okay well i'll go in the epidural go get an epidural that's my birth plan my birth plan is pain relief Mm -hmm. and it's like that's awesome I really hope that you get solid pain relief and a great epidural Mm -hmm. but have you thought about like the skill level of the person doing your epidural have you thought about your anatomy have you thought about the possibility of the epidural being one-sided or a poorly dosed epidural you know have you thought about um or the long-standing effects of the epidural long-standing effects like back pain, spinal headache, for example, Mm -hmm. you know, people don't do natural birth because there's a trophy at the end. Mm -hmm. People do natural birth because they want to avoid, you know, the cons of medications. It's not like they're just wanting to go through this difficult experience. They want to see, A, the power of their body, and then have this, you know, experience with their baby, and then they want to avoid all the things that come with, you know, the choices that are modern pain relief choices. Mm -hmm. So I definitely um, applaud anybody who's given birth because it's damn hard no matter what way you slice it. Mm -hmm. But to me, I, you know, specialize in natural birth support because that's what most of our clients want. So, um, we try to do a lot of continuing education as far as like spinning babies and like the hypnobirthing classes. We took an Amani birth doula training to serve our Orthodox Jewish clients that are um, all over the city of Pittsburgh. And Mm -hmm. we tried to continue to stay on top of like the up-to-date methods of pain relief or serving um, like our pregnant clientele right now. So, you know, it's definitely something that we love to do as far as pairing them up with other specialties too. We send a lot of people to chiropractic. We send a lot of people to pelvic floor therapy and it's such a huge difference for our clients and we can see it in their birth experiences Mm -hmm. um, firsthand, which is wild because not a lot of people get to see that besides the clients themselves, Mm -hmm. you know, so yeah, yeah, we can definitely notice the difference. Yeah, for sure. I, the natural just like how doulas aren't as well used where my office is a lot of a lot of my clients or not clients a lot of my patients will ask why on earth would you pick to be in pain and I feel like they must not give those cons in the birth classes because they're not aware of what the cons are until they've maybe already happened to them yeah, I mean, they're giving you informed consent when you're in pain during a contraction. You're desperate for relief. Mm-hmm. And that's not true informed consent. It's coercion, really. I mean, it's um, something that they should go over with you over and over and over again during your prenatals, whenever you're in the office with them, so that you could really understand what you're getting yourself into. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, it's it's not for nothing it's you're accepting a lot of different kinds of risks Mm -hmm. um, when you take pain relief and I've seen it be a great tool for a lot of people but it's also yeah something that we all have to 
get a little bit more educated on in our society because it's just very poorly presented to us um, Mm -hmm. until basically the last minute, you know? Yeah. I actually had a patient that had a toddler at home, delivered her baby with an epidural and her, it paralyzed her one leg and it came back after a few months like of rehab and stuff, but it's really hard to take a baby home without being able to walk and have a toddler with you right. as well. And uh, yeah, I think that even if that is a super, super slim chance, I think you need to know that well before you make that decision. For sure. I am. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Thank goodness I have never had anybody have any kind of um, catastrophic reaction to Mm -hmm. epidural, but I always remind people, you know, like epidurals naturally almost always will dilate the blood vessels and lower your blood pressure. So if you already have low blood pressure, right, the placenta relies on your blood pressure to Mm -hmm. push blood to the baby. So, you know, they'll do things like hang a liter of saline or like lactated bringers prior to dosing the epidural and they can push, you know, medicines to raise your blood pressure. Mm-hmm. But what you don't want is nobody watching your blood pressure and then your blood pressure dropping from the epidural and now mm-hmm. you have a baby in distress and you're having an emergency section, right? So right. if you already have issues with blood pressure, that's whenever I talk to my clients especially about it because I'm like, hey, this is something that you're already struggling with and then we're going to add fuel to the fire, you know? Mm-hmm. So um I've had clients who have been on medication that doesn't allow them to get an epidural. So, Mm -hmm. you know, then it's like, okay, well now we're talking, you either are doing like this one client couldn't have any kind of puncture um, in her spinal space or epidural space. So she couldn't even get like a spinal if she wanted it. So she would, her choice is rather natural childbirth with, you know, a doula, plenty of support or a C-section under general anesthesia. Oh, wow. She's like, well, I don't want to be unconscious when, like, and my baby to be laying on the warmer and they don't let dads back with general anesthesia. So mm-hmm. nobody's with the baby. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. So she chose to proceed with the natural birth. And I think knowing that it wasn't even an option on the table for her, like helped her push through, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. So everybody's story is just like so different. And, um, Mm-hmm. It's definitely like an honor to witness, you know, and be a witness of people's strength and also getting to celebrate so many birthdays is super fun. So. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I can't imagine. I think it would be a really cool experience for sure. Now, what are your, do you usually help moms within the hospital system or with it at the birthing center? I would say um, most of our clients go to McGee mm. um, in Pittsburgh, the main hospital here. Mm-hmm. And then we have some clients that go to West Penn as well, which is the other hospital. Mm-hmm. Clients that go to the Midwife Center and then home birth. So I would say the Midwife Center is maybe 30% of our births. Mm-hmm. And then home birth is... 10% and the other 60% is hospital birth. Okay. So you have a very varied view of, of all those for sure. Yeah. I've even had people who elect to have cesareans for their first delivery um, because of previous like sexual trauma, mm-hmm. which I also like to refer those people to public floor therapists as well. Yeah. And then also mental health therapists. Yeah. But, um, You know, if they choose that that's right for them, we make the best out of it that we're able to. We try to play music in the OR. Um, You know, we try to do immediate skin to skin as much as possible. So Mm -hmm. I think um, there's definitely ways to make it more pleasant if somebody chooses that. Yeah. Uh, I do a lot with pelvic floor therapy and I don't do internal work. If I feel like they need that little extra last bit, then I'll refer out. But I try to discourage people, especially if they have trauma like that, to jump right into internal work. I think it is way too, just like with giving birth would be traumatic for them. I think, you know, 
that area, you have to work through a whole other ball game before you can be comfortable with that. Absolutely. It changes your view of your body and your relationship with your body. And then also, I feel like um, our pelvic floor and just our pelvic health in general impacts so many different body systems that we don't even realize if you're not well educated on it. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it's really um, people learning about it, whether it's like through like pelvic health TikTok or reading Mm -hmm. Instagram posts about it, or just having a friend who went to pelvic floor therapy Mm -hmm. is so essential to kind of waking up to like, holy cow, something that happened to you maybe 15, 20 years ago can impact your whole life now on a Mm -hmm. day-to-day basis. And you don't realize it because you think you've already dealt with it. Mm -hmm. For sure. So now did you train with um, lay midwives before after I worked with you? Um, as a midwife assistant, you mean, or mm-hmm. um, as a doula? As a midwife assistant. Yeah, so I train with um, people in Pittsburgh that were candidates for the CPM. So they had completed all of their like paperwork and everything for it, and they were just waiting to test for, like, sit for their exam. So um, and then there's also traditional midwives that I trained with or yeah, more like traditional lay midwives, just community midwives mm-hmm. sure. that were, that knowledge is more like handed down kind of like apprenticeship style. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So as like a midwife assistant, we had to have like neonatal resuscitation training, life support, um, shoulder dystocia training for each drills. We had to do like cord prolapse drills. Mm-hmm. You know, what like every midwife assistant was also a doula previously, so they knew, you know, mm-hmm. how to support during a birth and how to support someone through that experience um, and what to expect of a birth. So it definitely shaped my work as a birth worker to have that experience. Mm-hmm. Um, but I no longer do assistant work anymore just because I'm going back to school and right. I don't really have time yeah. for it anymore. Yeah. But, It's an interesting journey from doula to midwife assistant to now doing the midwifery or the nurse masters in nursing into midwifery. So that is very, very cool. I love the whole field, but thanks. I'm, um, I'm really excited about it. And if the CPM route was more recognized in Pennsylvania, I think I would have done that. Um, but for future prospects, like, Mm-hmm. The birth centers and the hospitals really only allow CNMs to practice to mm-hmm. have like privileges there. So I didn't want to limit myself in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, mm-hmm. As far as other states go, some states recognize the CPMs and allow them to have autonomy. But Pittsburgh specifically has a lot of, um, you know, it's like a powder keg between the hospitals and then um there's one birthing center, which is like the largest in the nation, which stands independently and it's a nonprofit, but then it gets large donations from MC and it's almost like, um, you know, there's lots of different conflicts of interest going on that I was like, well, I feel like CPMs might not ever be recognized because there's such a strong hold Mm -hmm. of the medical community in Pittsburgh and Pennsylvania in general. Yeah. Um, so I kind of didn't want to count on it. I was like, oh, I'll just go for my nurse midwifery license so that I have the certifications that they want so that I can practice the way I want. <laughs> sure, for sure. Now, yeah. your your company also does, I just want to touch on that, the, um, the postpartum doula services yep. as well, which as a chiropractor... I feel like that is where we really drop the ball. People are really good about coming in because they want to get their, you know, either have an easy labor or their breach and they want to the baby to turn or something specific. And then once they have the baby, it's all about baby's appointments and they forget themselves and it, 
it is really easy to not take care of themselves afterwards. So the postpartum doula thing, I think, is so important and such a nice option for people. Yeah, it kind of gives you that cushion from being in a setting where you are, like, for most people at a hospital birth, they are so taken care of um, by, like, the nurses and things in their recovery room. Mm -hmm. And then when you get home, you know, most partners don't have great leave. Mm -hmm. And then you're at home with this baby that you're like, okay, well, I guess I am supposed to just figure out how to take care of you, (laughs) but I'm also healing and recovering and have this wound on the inside of my uterus. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it's just, and then you're trying to figure out like breastfeeding or you're pumping and it's just, um, you need a lot of support because you're not sleeping either. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) you're not even able to nail the basics of like your sick needs, you know? So that's kind of where postpartum doula comes in is they're optimizing, making sure that you and your baby are getting everything that you need, you know, those boxes checked. And then also helping you specifically with this baby, how to soothe this baby, how to help this baby sleep well Mm -hmm. and eat well. And, you know, even if you've had four kids, the fifth one could have colic Mm -hmm. or be really cranky sleeper and, you know, only want to sleep while being held like most newborns. So um, I try to say like postpartum doulas are experts in giving you, telling you how they would approach helping this specific child. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I, I think that that is definitely a cool aspect of your business for sure. Along with the the photography is always, that's such a neat (laughs) add on because you don't even remember parts of it. And then you look back at your photography and you're like, oh my goodness. Yeah, I I always love to see, you know, even like as a doula, sometimes I forget parts because I'm just like so in the zone. But um, when you're doing the photography add on too, and most of our girls available as, an add-on for their clients it's just Mm -hmm. a really great way to kind of remember and reminisce because it yeah it's truly is like a blink blink of an eye and then it passes you Mm -hmm. you think like people spend so much on weddings or wedding photography or Mm -hmm. you know day of coordinators and event planners and then weddings don't have the potential to traumatize you and traumatize (laughs) the relationship with your body and your partner and your baby Mm -hmm. but birth does you know yeah and postpartum does so investing in yourself and your experience is just so so important because it can really change a lot of the dynamics within yourself and your family Mm -hmm. Um, and you know whenever it goes great it can be this empowering experience that transforms you know your life and your relationship with your body so I think people seeing how powerful they can be and how capable they are is also mm-hmm. really like an incredible part of birth too. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you so much for all the, I think that is a great look into different aspects of what a doula does postpartum and during birth and prenatal. You know, it seems like you give a lot of education as well, you know, where they might lack some of it. Um but also, you know, seeing how natural childbirth might play out and that kind of thing, just because I think we've gotten away from it for so long. And with, you know, maternal mortality rate and that kind of thing, it's nice to maybe try a different route. Right. We're actually, uh, launching Pittsburgh Birth Project, which is a nonprofit that we're going to help um, at-risk communities specifically, you know, get access to better care like pelvic PT, like Cairo, like home birth midwives, all those things that, you know, your insurance might not cover that really help you have a better experience and Mm -hmm. at the end of the day, help advocate for you and fight maternal and infant mortality. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's, uh, one of our nonprofits that you can be out like on the lookout for um, nice. 
here soon. We'll get our website up, but we just got approved for our 501c3 status. So that's super exciting. Oh, awesome. um, but yeah. And then the other resource I would all, also recommend, obviously, is like the Ida Mae Gaskin's Guide to Childbirth. And then mm -hmm. um, the birth partner is a really great read for anybody that's going to be in the presence of somebody that is laboring, um, just knowing how to support them and how to hold space, you know, what mm -hmm. not to do, trying to match the energy and how you can be helpful. It's sure. a uh, really great resource. Awesome. Well, I'll have to get all, get all those links from you and we can add them into the blog post and underneath the show notes and stuff so that people can access that because that would be great. Perfect. Right. Thanks for having me on, Kate. I appreciate it. All right. Have a great one, Lily. It was nice talking to you. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. I look forward to working with you guys. And if you have any thing, topics that you'd like discussed, make sure to comment below and let me know because I'd be happy to share all the knowledge that I have on those issues.